So when Muhammad was in a cave of Hira, ask yourself, Muslims, who was he praying to? He was praying to the same Allah as the pagans. Something else going, that's going to get them busted. Jinn are made out of fire. But it says right here that Allah made from water every living thing. If Allah is outside of everything, when he looks at things, where does he process it? Where is it taking place? The Quran itself is a weak hadith because from the very start, the Isnad, the chain of narration is broken. Pulling up Surah 2130. Have those who disbelieved not considered that the heavens and the earth were a joined entity and we separated them and made from water every living thing? Then will they not believe? Boom, okay. Surah 2130 just proved everything that I was saying. The key word, joined entity, a, a entity outside of time and space, because he said, come into being, right? Now, this verse is a contradiction to Surah 4111. It said, have those who disbelieve not considered that the heavens and the earth, and this is a false um, translation. I gotta point this out. It doesn't say consider, it says, do they not see? And the reason why they, they didn't put see right there, like it really says in the Arabic, because it's a stupid verse because it's Allah going to unseen evidence to validate seen evidence. He's saying, have those who disbelieve not considered the heavens and the earth, but it really says see. How can somebody see that the heavens and the earth were a joint entity, and you are saying that as evidence for why they should believe in Allah when nobody was created during the time of this story or this event when you sang that the um, heavens and earth were joined together. Also in 4111, he's not addressing a single entity. He addresses two separate entities in the smoke and the earth. And they, as a plural, answer him in a, you know, as a we, rather than it, it would be the one unity, the one unified entity saying, yes, I will come into being and then being separated out into the earth and the smoke. So, sorry, go ahead. It also points out another thing, Kay, that it's like a trinity. In 2130, it's a trinity because it's saying it's joined. It's two separate- It's a duality of, for the, yeah. It's a duality, right? It's like, it's like smoke and earth joined together, but yet they are different, but they in one. Now, in this verse, you have Allah saying, so he separated the, the two. But in the other verse, it says he called them to come together. So which one is it? Read, can you read 4111 again and, and compare it to 2130? Okay, is this, then yes. he directed himself to the heaven while it was smoke and said to it and to the earth. So the and is a conjoining word. It joins the two separate things and to the earth, come in brackets into being, willingly or by compulsion they said so not one of them they said we have come willingly that's what 4111 says and in 2130 it says that they was joined together but 4111 doesn't say anything about them being joined together no, so doesn't. that's a contradiction so yeah. which one is it yes it goes on to say and we separated them and made from water every living thing and I would challenge that. I don't have the reference on me because I didn't know this was like what you were going to be discussing. But I know of a verse that says that Adam was created from a clot or a sperm or I think the dust or the earth, something like that, or the clay. So, I mean, that in itself is like a bit of a discrepancy that Allah doesn't, like in different parts, he says, diff he ascribes different origins to Adam. But other than that, we learn here, um, quite surprisingly, that everything is made from water. And yet he forgets to mention that when discussing the creation of the first man, Adam. So and I would consider that, um, like if this was an essay and I was being asked to grade it, like I would say, well, I need some, uh, like something to tie that narrative up into, you know, what is the actual original material? 
And something else that I like to point out, um, it says we separated them and made from water every living thing, okay? But they were already living. But it says that he made, and it says that he separated them and made from water every living thing, but they was already living because he was speaking to them in 4111. So how were they made out of water? And he said he made it from water after he separated them every living thing. Yoga. And another something else going, that's going to get them busted. Jinn are made out of fire. Oh, okay. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Jinn okay. are made out of fire, but it says right here that all are made from water every living thing. Don't make sense. Yeah. They was already living, K. You get what I'm saying? They was already yeah, alive. He was already speaking to them. They was even alive space. Full creation. Remember how pointing out? Yeah. Yeah. Remember how we pointed out he, he called them into physical being? They was already alive. So they wasn't made out of of they wasn't made out of uh water like it says. Unless there comes a prequel to the Quran with a further story um about their uh the the state that they were in pre pre existence, we have to assume, I guess, that they're eternal also. Because if they understand Allah's speech, if they are comfortable enough to address him without any uh, reverence, if they are non conjoined but in some sort of unity, depending on which verse you go to, they for sure existed before the creation of the official heaven and the official earth because as we know in islam there's more than one heaven anyway so there's seven of them right. i believe so yeah we don't know which numbered heaven this is that was joined to the earth i'm guessing like the seven, like the lowest one but um yeah it just it, it asks more questions than it answers really and that's just too um ayah so right like it's so much it's yeah. so much yeah it's so much you can expose like the Quran is like this. It's so disorganized that you don't have to, you don't have to read it to dis, to expose it because it's not organized anyway. You just go to the parts that is going to contradict itself. Now, this is another thing, Kay, a big, big, big point. How can something uncreated have contradictions in it? Not even that. How can God, who is all-knowing and perfect have any contradictions well like he can't exactly. because he's the creator of all he's the author and finisher of my faith anyway so and Kay, i want to i want to bring um something else up to point you know how muslims say because we can clear the whole table right here you know how muslims say that allah cannot enter into creation yeah i've heard that, that many, is many a times limit. can you pull up that bible verse as a matter of fact let me let me pull this verse up the bible had it right all the while I'm, I'm gonna tell you what i'm talking about muslims say that muhammad i mean allah does not enter into creation i'm about to, i'm about to bust that right now it don't make sense here's why okay me and you we have eyes mm -hmm. although you can't see my eyes we both have eyes and our eyes are connected to our brain so everything we see that appears to be outside of us it's really taking place internally inside of us because the brain processes the images. Yeah. So basically, the outside is an illusion. Well, we the, live, out, the outside is happening, but the processing of the outside can only take place on the inside. So if there are no eyes to see, the things to exist, but not for the person. So not for me. If if I, you know, if my eyes are covered, I can't tell you how many fingers you're holding. I can't access reality yeah everything everything is a projection of the brain even what you think you're feeling from the outside you couldn't feel it without your it's brain processing your what brain, your, yeah. yeah your spinal cord and everything everything is taking place internally that's why i said that the outside is an illusion mm -hmm. so everything that you see is processing your brain everything that you hear is processing your brain everything you taste is processing your brain, everything you smell, your nose, your nose, your nasal passages, they write under your right, right there under your brain. Everything mm -hmm. is taking place in your brain. That's why you are basically your brain. Your body is basically basically like is a vehicle a for a driver. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Everything, if Allah is all seen, right? 
That means everything that he beholds is taking place what? Within his consciousness. So just like for us, how can you be outside of what's taking place on the inside of you? Because whatever Allah is looking at, it's been processed internally within his consciousness. And that's why I'm about to read this verse from the Bible that proves what I'm saying. Acts 17, 28, KJV. For in him we live and move and have our what? Being. Yeah. As certain also of your own prophets have said, for we are all his offspring. We, that means we are the offspring of his thoughts, of his creation from inside of him, because it tells you, for in him we live and move and have our being. Mm -hmm. that, wasn't that what I was just saying? Yeah. Everything's taking place on the side. Yeah, because God is, we live because our God, God is powerful enough to enter creation, not with uh, not one eye. Or, or whatever we were discussing earlier, the hen toes. But um, our God is literally everywhere at the same time. Everywhere. So we must so live in him, we must move in him and have our being in yeah. him. Yeah, and we are so his what, children. What, yeah. yeah, so my question to the Muslims is, after reading this verse, which makes so much sense, even scientifically, like the example I explained with the eye and the brain process and everything on the inside, if Allah is outside of everything, when he looks at things, where does he process it? Where is it taking place? <laughs> I think where is it taking why place? he has to have the arrangement with Jibril and uh, with Muslims having, a, I think, a jinn on either shoulder who, or an angel. I'm not, I can't remember, to be honest, um, that weigh their angel. good deeds and their bad deeds. But there's a hadith that says, uh, an angel will not come somewhere where there's the ringing of a bell, or I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just about to say that what you just said. Go, go yeah. yeah, that's good. So, as you see, the way um, Muslims describe Allah, He doesn't exist. Perfect. Even let's break down the usage of words, right? All all words were created to navigate through a tangible universe. That's the only okay. reason why you need words. To navigate to through a ideas, tangible universe. Yeah, to be able to function, to be able to socialize, like, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Because we, we learn through word and picture association. A, apple, flash a card with a red apple, make the vowel sound for a, you teach a child how to read, through word and picture association. All words were created for a tangible universe. Muslims say that Allah is outside of everything. He is intangible, he is inconceivable, and he is incomprehensible to the human mind. If that's the case, then how can you apply any word to something that exists outside of the tangible universe where words were created to be used at in the first place? Perfect. So that means every word in the Quran that's related to Allah, it falls flat on his face. Yeah, for sure. Because when you say the word he, the word H-E, that wasn't created for a being outside of everything that's inconceivable, incomprehensible, and intangible. No words in the dictionary yeah. was created for beings like that. In uh -huh. fact, you can't even call Allah a being because yeah. the word being begins with the prefix B. You got to be somewhere to be a being. You got to be in G. Being inside of something, in a body, a physical yeah. structure. So to even call Allah a being, you are miscommunicating and you are uh, inappropriately... Describing qualities using. that do not befit him. Excellent. Right. Yeah. You are you inappropriately using the word. It's a misusage of words. Yeah. So every word in the Quran that's directed to Allah is a misusage of words. Islam is sexist because no. out of all the Wait, can we just all of can we get that groundbreaking news again? Islam is sexist. And I'm gonna tell you I why. don't believe you. Prove it. With these words. I'm gonna tell you why. Here, here's why, okay? Because Allah is not a gender. 
So why call him a he? Why does it matter? Why can't he be a she? Why can't she be a he? Why pick he or instead he? of saying she? Yeah. So the Muslims say she, I worship Allah, my she God, but it's not a gender anyway. So why does it matter if you call it she or he? Because either way, you misappro you are um misappropriating the word. I just explained that words were created for things in the tangible universe. So if you're gonna call Allah a he, which is not really a he because he doesn't fall under that definition, why not just say a she? So for now on, I'm gonna to refer to Allah as she. So Muslims will to <laughs> No, 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 you Allah. can't do that because that would imply that uh, <laughs> she is only half as intellectually uh, efficient as a male counterpart. Because as we know, um, Muhammad had never seen, uh, you know, like the women he knew anyway were deficient in mind and religion, and they were all she. Mm. So that's also unbefitting to Allah's majesty. Toasty. Sorry. Right. But yeah. No, it's all good. Like everything we said is tying and connecting. Like I don't know how much time we got left, but just in closing. So I would reiterate, um, oh gosh, there's so many things we've touched on, but for sure um, Allah has entered into time and space because we know that Muslims will eventually recognize him in his true form. So he has a shape, a shape must be by definition in creation because um, even when they look towards him, their eyes with their 150,000 light uh, sensitive nerve endings they are also in creation it's a miracle of our god's creation that the human eye exists in such a way that it relays information it flips the image it's interpreted by the brain that god gave us women included and they all fire on all cylinders so that that proves that allah is not only in creation because i've heard people argue ah but they're just looking towards their lord but their sight is in creation so if he's he can be perceived within creation. He is in some form in creation. Perfect. Other than that, I would point out that an all powerful God, whether like, so you could argue he just doesn't want to, that's absolutely fine. But what I've heard is he cannot enter creation. And that for me means he is not all powerful. He doesn't have ultimate potentiality because there is something he cannot do or choose it or right. will not do. And to me, um, I know that the God of the Bible, who I serve, um, can do all things and that I, through him, can do all things that, he, you know, his plans for us as Christians are to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a future and a hope. That's what it says in Jeremiah. That's one of my favorite verses. And um, I just don't understand a God who uh, advocates like some of the things. So if, ah, the other, ah, that's it. So when you say he, why is he called a he, um, Allah? I would suggest that that comes from Muhammad's veneration of the Torah. Literally, he placed it on a cushion. He said, I accept thee and the one who sent thee, which is Yahweh. Right. So Muhammad uh, yeah, venerated the Torah. Uh, potentially, uh, I imagine that in the Islamic narrative, it was yet to be corrupted. Um, in the seventh or eighth century, when seventh century when he did that, but because Yahweh is known as Father, therefore we know that he has a male essence, and I think that's translated into the Quran because Allah claims ownership of the Torah and the Injil by saying that He revealed them in Hebrew, uh, because obviously He, you know, He learned a new language by them. So yeah. That's my right. wrap up. Have you got anything further to add? Well, after what we said today, that's the nail in the coffin. I mean, it's it's not it's nothing. It's no way you can logically refute anything that we said today. So next time we meet, we'll just go into uh, Surah Two One Hundred Six and some other things that I want to bring up, and we can Brilliant. just totally just we can just smash it. Because I'm the type of person. What I want to say is. I usually don't even debate Muslims until first they got to tell me what is it that you are worshiping? Because if I just wanted to disprove the Quran, I can just throw something at them like this. Just, just real quick, can you pull up um, 
And this kind of relates to the coronavirus thing. Just real quick, can you pull up Sora 1435? So, and, and then bracketed, mention O Muhammad, when Abraham said, my Lord, make this city, in brackets, Mecca, secure and keep me and my sons away from worshiping idols. And that's Surah 14, Ayah 35. When I'm dealing with Muslims, the first thing that I tell them is, first, because I really don't debate Muslims, I smash Muslims. I just smash their whole rhetoric before it gets off Modesty the ground. Modesty as well. First I say, before I talk to anybody about religion, you've got to tell me what is it that you are worshiping? Is it a spirit? Is it an energy? Is it matter? What is Allah? They can't tell you what Allah is. At least the pagan Arabs had a stone or something that they could touch or could tell you. The Muslims today, he don't have anything. He doesn't even know what he's worshiping. He doesn't know where he's going in the afterlife. Um, he doesn't have any clue because Allah is not a spirit, because they are not connected to Allah. They are like a, a child with no umbilical cord. It's like they're just floating around like lost, lost matter, lost particles of matter through space with no connection to God. I they don't know who God is. I think they don't have no umbilical there's no, cord. There's no person, there can be no relationship with a slave master. Um, so because there's no connection, no personal, like Allah, I don't believe, I don't know that he's touching the hearts of Muslims. And I've heard Muslims say that it's very, it causes them great anxiety not to know if Allah is pleased with their, um, you know, with their performance of their rituals and their daily devotions and stuff like that. You can't ever be sure that he's satisfied. And so it's an endless task of trying to please a God who's separate well done and yeah. there you go and the is short allah is the imagination of muhammad that's why they don't know who he is allah is muhammad it's whatever he said because when allah was because when muhammad you see how i'm saying allah and muhammad's twisting it up because they really the same thing mm -hmm. so if i say muhammad i'm saying allah if i say allah i'm saying muhammad so when muhammad was in the cave of hira of hira i don't know if i'm pronouncing it right mm -hmm. but he was in the cave right while he was in the cave, the Muslims were still the Muslims were still worshiping Allah, the pagan god of the three uh, daughters that that um, the cranes. Alat. Remember the three cranes? Uh, yeah, Alat, Al Uzza, and Manat. Yeah. Right, right. And notice how their names begin with Al. Yeah, one Lat. of them is the feminine you know? form of Allah. Yeah, Alat. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. Allah, Alat. Al Uzza. It's just pagan gods. Perfect. So when so when Muhammad was in the cave of Hira, ask yourself, Muslims, who was he praying to? He was praying to the same Allah as the pagans. Yeah, and his father was named Abdullah, which means slave of Allah. Muhammad said himself that his father went to hell. So if his father went to hell and he was worshiping the same Allah that Muhammad was worshiping in the cave of Hira, and during this time, the only uh, view that Muhammad had of Allah was just like every other pagan. He didn't have no Quran. He didn't have no monotheism. And while he was in the cave of Hira, the 360 idols were still being stored in the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. So while your prophet was in that cave praying to Allah, the idols were still being housed in the Kaaba. So you, so tell me who he praying to. He's praying to the pagan deity. Now, yeah. how can you get a divine true revelation while praying to a pagan deity. That's telling you that the revelation that he got was from a demonic visitation because you can't get a true revelation while praying to a false pagan god. So that's yeah, why unlikely. Um, the Quran is false because it, it didn't come from prayer to the real true God. It came from prayer to the Allah who had three daughters. Yeah. And then they want to, you know how they're so good to reject hadiths? When you think about it, the Quran itself is a hadith. For what was sure. that verse you had said? It says, what was oh, that verse you had said? Well, the, the verse that I just thought of is um, the challenge within the Quran to bring a hadith like this 
So the hadith like this implies that the Quran is its is itself a hadith. So yeah. Okay. I'm gonna piggyback off what you just said. The way they Muslims are so fast to reject a hadith, even if it's a sahih, anytime they hear something that doesn't support their rhetoric, they quick to reject it. But I'm about to get them busted. And I'm not doing this with no animosity. I'm doing this just to shine light. This is not no personal attack. I'm just talking about information. Now, the Quran itself is a weak hadith because from the very start, the isnad, the chain of narration is broken mm -hmm. because the demon spirit that visited Muhammad, he didn't formally address himself. He didn't say who he was. As the so as angels do in the Bible, I might add. Yeah, yeah. like the angels in the Bible do. That's like, like the angels in the Bible do. That's a real hadith that you can record back to who gave the narration. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the Quran, the hadith that, the saying that um, Muhammad got in the cave, he don't know who the first narrator is. So from the very start, the Quran is a weak hadith. Because yeah, they don't know that. who the narrator is. Who is the first narrator? The person, uh, I believe one of um, Muhammad's relatives told him who... Uh, he, went um, to, he went to his wife and his wife took him to uh, Warraka who was a heretical Christian or a, an early, like a, yeah, it's some sect of Christianity. Um, so yeah, that's, I believe that if, I believe really that I suppose Warwicker is the founder of Islam, because if he didn't say, <laughs> yes, this is clearly Jibreel, um, and I don't know how he got the clearly Jibreel because Gabriel doesn't go around in the Bible uh, throttling people or compelling them to read anything um, mm. or recite. So I'm not sure on his ID techniques. I don't, I know he didn't have a photo fit. Like I don't know how he just got to that massive conclusion. And also Hafs, the guy whose Quran is, um, I believe Saudi Arabia, except the Hafs Quran. Um, he himself, his own Hadith, other than the Quran, um, are also mainly considered weak because he is recorded okay. as people who watch Christian Christian Prince will see that he is a weak narrator because of his dishonesty. So he's accused of right. stealing books and uh, basically like plagiarizing other people's uh, stuff. So to not right. accept his Hadith as weak, but to accept his Quran, to me is just mind boggling. I don't, I don't understand it. And to add to that, Kay, have you heard that Hadith that says that um, Muhammad said that Anybody who made up a false hadith about him would go into the hell fight. Have you heard that one? Um, I think I might have. Uh, this hell is going to be pretty we busy. Sorry. Yeah, we can bring it up next show. But we can bring yeah. it up next show. I'll line it up for we, another yeah, time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it says so. That means the Quran that they have today, the Hoff's narration, they are narrating the words of a man that's right now presently in hell. And to add to what she said, or to add what I was saying, like um, Warica, as she just said, is the one who told Muhammad that it was Jibril. So that proves my point that the Quran is a weak hadith because the eyewitness report was not there. You can't take an eyewitness from somebody else that's not even on the scene. Where they do that at? <laughs> the courtroom won't accept anything like that. And this is another thing. Um, you was talking about he was a uh, Catholic or something you had said. So that proves that. Oh, a heretical Christian. Yeah, a Christian, a heretical Christian. Yeah. So that means from the gate, Islam borrowed from the Bible using a angel name from the Bible, a Hebrew name, because it ends with L. Yeah. Why doesn't it have an Arabic name? It's a Hebrew name, so that means it's borrowed from a from the uh, Judeo Christian. The true name of, from from El Gabor, from God, like actually yeah. Yahweh. So yeah. Yeah, like the thing like, is, if, yeah. if Arabic is the uh, divine language of Allah, His preferred like mother tongue. I don't know how to say it. 
then why is he busy sending 124,000 prophets to different nations in their own tongue? Because if he is an all-powerful God, he could make Arabic some kind of, like encoded into your DNA almost. He could make people understand it because with the Holy Spirit, we are able to discern and uh, understand things that without it, like, you know, so Christians reading the Bible have a completely different experience from non-Christians because we have discernment and we have the spirit to uh, guide us in wisdom and in truth. So, yeah, I That's think we're going to... That's a brilliant point. We have point. to wrap and it up, though. So what are your final thoughts? Well, my final thought is about what you just said. Why couldn't Allah encode? Because when you read the Bible at Pentecost, God gave them the ability to understand yes. every language. Like the apostles, when they went out, they could understand. So all they, of our, you know. each heard it in their own tongue. Yeah, he, he did it. So that's a good point that you made. But in closing, um, like I say, like um, Islam to me is not, I don't call it debating. It's just pointing out the illogical things and statements within Islam, the contradictions with this, within Islam. But like everything I said today, like, I, I I don't see how it's hard or to get tangled up like you stuck and don't can't have an answer to the question a Muslim asks you or you can't refute what they say. It's so easy to destroy. Like I was asking you, like to bring up, like oh I didn't mention this. This will be my last thing. That's okay. Surah fourteen thirty five. Okay, in that verse that you put up, when you read the Tafsir on that verse by Jalalain, that's a covenant that Abraham, that um, Allah made with Abraham. And Allah granted the covenant. And when you read a tafsir, it tells you that Allah was supposed to secure Mecca and that no blood was supposed to be spilled in Mecca. So from that verse alone, you may as well just trash the Quran because when you do your history, and even in the Islamic sources, Mecca, was uh, overthrown by a man by the name of Karmati, Karmati. And you can look it up. They called it the Karmatians, the Karmatians, something like that. Mm -hmm. And what they did is he stole the black stone. Mm -hmm. He killed Muslims and he, um, he killed the Muslim pilgrims who was at Hajj, stole the black stone, and he threw their bodies in the Zamzam well, which is in Mecca. Yeah. And it's where Hayek and Ishmael uh, found secure in the wilderness. Yeah. He spilled their blood and everything, but Surah 1435 says that Allah was supposed to secure Mecca. And not only that, but the Muslims had to pay a ransom to get the black stone back. Allah didn't get it back for them. They had to go out their pockets. They had to pay a ransom. There was another hadith that says that the black stone is the right hand of Allah. So you telling me it's that gonna, today, Hang on, hang on, Muslims. <laughs> it's going to grow a mouth at the end of time. I know I'm running out of time, but at the end of time, the Kaaba will grow a mouth and it will vouch. It, it, it tells us that far from being the house of uh, Abraham or, you know, a comet or whatever it's supposed to be, it's only there to differentiate between Muslims and non-Muslims and to point out Jews who are hiding, you know. So it's got multiple uh, functions, even though in the Quran or the Hadith, I'm not sure we're told that it just has the one well, function, which is to justify Muslims for Allah. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Okay. They say, like you said, in the, in the last days, it's supposed to grow a mouth, tongue, and testify on who touched it and all of that. How are we supposed to do that? And today, the black stone is broken up into tiny pieces. Muslims have to glue it together just to hold it up in the corner of the Kaaba. There's a hadith that says that the black stone is the right hand of Allah. So you're telling me that the right hand of Allah was stolen and broken into seven pieces? And this is the same It can't stone. end in creation, so I don't know how. Which is, yeah, yeah, it ends yeah. creation. And this is the same stone that um, Muhammad said in a hadith that if you rub it, it will erase your sins. So this stone 
will grant you salvation, but the very stone that you're supposed to rub to grant you salvation, it couldn't even save itself from getting stolen and broken into eight pieces. So you're telling me you betting upon a stone being able to wipe away your sins, but this very stone with this magical power couldn't even save itself, keyboard salvation, couldn't even save itself from being stolen and broken into pieces, but you believe that rubbing a broken stone that couldn't save itself self from devastation will wipe away your sins. Muslims, you repent see? and come to Christ. I don't know what else to say. Like, I think that wraps it up nicely, but a stone is not going to save you. There are Bible verses about, like, literally worshipping stones and wood. It will avail you nothing. Sins cannot be erased. They can only be justified by the blood of Christ, as, as we know. And um, thank you very much, Jacob, for coming to speak to me. And uh, we're going to do some more of these videos, and uh, you'll be seeing those I'm, soon. You know, I'm going to get back on that stone next time, because I haven't. Y'all not going to escape that stone. I got more to go right. into about that stone. <laughs> No worries. Yeah, I really enjoy also, it. Also, remember that Jacob's channel, channel rather, on YouTube is The False Prophet, um, ironically. False prophet. I don't know if he just pulled that out of the air and then found one to, uh, to polemicize. But anyway, thanks very much, and uh, we'll talk again soon. God bless everybody in the comments. All right, bye.